here in the CS department. Uh, I did my undergrad uh, at Williams College in Massachusetts, and then went to grad school at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, and I like hiking, backpacking, Dungeons and Dragons, games of all kinds, uh, history, as, as you'll see, uh, and uh, musical theater. So, uh, outline for today, uh, I want to kind of talk about some of the big themes of the course, and show you some demonstrations that I think will uh, hopefully motivate why we need to care about computer systems and what is actually going on underneath the surface when we run a computer program. Uh, and uh, then I will talk about uh, a way that we're going to think about numbers when we're thinking about how data is represented on computers, particularly uh, binary numbers and base 16 or hexadecimal numbers uh, and then I'll end kind of going over the syllabus and kind of an outline of the course and where you can find uh, pieces of, of relevant information. So, start with a big picture. Like, why take this course? I mean, it is required if you're a CS major. But another reason, or kind of one of my big picture goals, is that this course will make you a better programmer. Like, you're going to do a significant amount of programming in this course. It's likely going to be kind of diff a different way of thinking about programming than perhaps you have in the past. And uh, you're going to be programming at kind of a lower level, diving deeper into the guts of a computer system uh, than, than you've likely had to before. And kind of as a result of this course, I think you're going to come out understanding computer systems at a deeper level. And this is going to serve you well in writing uh, efficient, correct code uh, in, in whatever application. Uh, that's kind of a big picture goal. One of the um, kind of key emphases of this course is independent problem solving. So I think part of being a good programmer is being a good problem solver. And uh, there's going to be a series of lab assignments that I'll talk more about later. Uh, many of these lab assignments will challenge you to explore and figure things out on your own. And that's an important part of, of the skills that you're learning in this course. In particular, some of the assignments will uh, be done in the programming language C. Some of you may have, have used it before, some of you may have not. There's not an expectation that you know C uh, coming into this course, and there are uh, some important weird things about C that we'll talk a lot about in class, uh, but there are many parts of C that we're not going to spend time on class, uh, time on in class, such as standard library functions, particular aspects of syntax. These are things that are very easy uh, to find online. There are many resources linked from the course webpage, and it will be my expectation that you do some of this learning independently. So, one thing that goes along with that is if you can internalize kind of one uh, uh, idea to apply and just at a meta level of how you approach this course, it would be to start early and ask lots of questions. Uh, and and I'll, I'll come back to that when we kind of look at the, the kind of overall schedule for the course. So, like to kind of demonstrate some of the important themes of the course. So, uh, let's see if we can make the lights better. Switch is hiding. Uh -huh. All right, 
So I have open here VS Code, uh, and uh, you're not required to use VS Code in this course, uh, but for many of the assignments, you will need to do them on a Linux computer. And what I have found, the easiest way to do this is to, rather than trying to set up your own computer uh, to have Linux on it, um, and the lab computers have uh, Mac uh, OS or Windows on them, not Linux, uh, there is a computer in a closet somewhere on campus called Mantis. Uh, it's connected to the internet, and using VS Code, I can connect to Mantis and then kind of work on that computer, which is a Linux computer, as if it was my own computer. So I want to show you how this works. Uh, the first step would be uh, you will need to have the remote SSH extension installed, and there will be written instructions to do this along with the first lab, but since this is a slightly involved setup process, I want to go through it today uh, just so that you uh, see it multiple times. Uh, but there is a remote SSH extension that will allow us to connect VS Code to something like Mantis. And then in the lower left of the VS Code window, there's this little orange uh, uh, thing. And if I click on it, a menu pops up. I know it's very small, but I'm going to click the Connect Current Window to Host option, because I want to connect this window of VS Code to Mantis, uh, the host. And I have set up some uh, remote servers already, but Mantis isn't in this list. Let's see if I can make this all right, so a little more legible. And so I'm going to go to Add New SSH Host. And what comes up is something for me to enter the SSH command. So this is something I could actually enter in a terminal if I wanted to connect that way. Uh, but I will enter SSH, which is a kind of secure way to connect to some uh, computer over the internet. And then I'll put in my Carlton username, AWB, at, and then the full URL for Mantis, which is mantis.mathcs.carlton.edu. As I said, all of these, you'll receive all these instructions in, in writing, as well as you will be able to refer to today's recording. As you can see, uh, I'll be recording all the, all the 208 uh, lectures. I think I'll try and use this, but it appears this is not recording audio today, so we're in this other setup. Um, anyway, SSH, my username at mantis.mantis.carlton.edu. Hit enter. It's going to ask me which SSH configuration file do I want to save this in. I always just choose the first option. And then it's added that configuration. A little box pops up down here where I can then click Connect. And something pops up saying Mantis has fingerprint string of, of letters and numbers. This is just saying this computer has not connected to Mantis before. Did you actually mean to connect to Mantis, yes or no? I did. So I'll click Continue. And then my computer connects. There are two other steps which you may encounter uh, when you connect. The first, and I'm not exactly sure when this happens, but you may be asked, what kind of computer are you, are you connecting to? Windows, Linux, or Mac? You are connecting to a Linux computer. Mantis is Linux, so that's what you would, you would put. And you will probably also be asked for your Carlton password. I have my laptop set up so that it knows uh, that, that it doesn't need a password to connect. So what I have now is a terminal open on Mantis. And I can say run ls to see all the files in my, my home directory there. I could run the command pwd to print the current directory that I'm in, and slash account slash awb, that's my home directory. And VS Code kind of operates by being open in a particular folder, and then we'll work with the files in there. So I'm going to click Open Folder, and then navigate to the CS208 web page. This is not something you would need to do, but this is where the 
demo files are. So it kind of restarts VS Code opening in that particular folder. You'll probably be prompted for your password again when you do this. All right, so let's start with something pretty, uh, perhaps, hopefully straightforward. I have a Java program here. It multiplies four numbers together. And I have this Java program here to illustrate one of the themes of this course is going to be that memory is finite. We have a, a computer, it has some memory, but it does not have unlimited memory. And there are many things about the way computer systems behave that are a consequence of the fact that memory is finite. And this is one of them. So we would expect you know, maybe a large, num large positive number to be printed you know, when we multiply these four together. So in the terminal, if I say Java int test, I see something very strange. Is that big enough for folks in the back to see? Should it be bigger? OK. Uh, well, something very strange. You see this large negative number when we multiply 200 times 300 times 400 times 500. This is very weird. And this, as you can imagine, might cause serious bugs in a computer program where I was assuming that multiplying these four uh, numbers together was going to kind of give me the, the mathematically uh, appropriate result. And this is a consequence of the fact that we use a finite number of bits, finite number of ones and zeros, to represent an integer in the computer's memory. And given the number of bits we have, it's not actually enough to represent the real answer to 200 times 300 times 400 times 500. And so we get something uh, very surprising. And so one of the topics we'll cover in this course is what are these representations that we use for integers and why does this behavior occur? Questions on, on this? Anything so far? Let's look at another weird thing with numbers. This is now floating point numbers, not integers. And I have two multiplications here. 2.5 times 0.1 times 1.5. And the second time, all I've done is rearrange the order that these multiplications happen in. And again, mathematically, should there be any difference between x and y? Should these be the same or, or different? The same. The same. Yeah, they should clearly be the same. Multiplication is what we call commutative. We can swap the order. It should give us the same result. But alas, when I run float test, I see they're not the same. The first one is what I expect, 0.375. The second one, 0.375, with a tiny, tiny error in the result. I mean, this error doesn't show up until I don't know, the, the quintillionths place, something like that. But nonetheless, if I say, are these two results equal, Java will tell me, well, no, of course not. They're not equal. See, there's this tiny little difference between them. And again, this is a consequence of we are using a finite amount of memory to represent these numbers. And in fact, the result of 0.1 times 1.5, which we do first here, and which we don't actually do here, we do this multiplication first and then multiply by 1.5. The result of this multiplication we can't actually represent precisely using the bits available. We can just get very, very close. And it turns out very, very close can cause surprising problems. And so, again, something that we need to keep in mind when we're writing software, that this limited precision uh, can, actually, can actually matter. All right, so that's our kind of memory is finite theme. And another theme that I want to illustrate is that uh, Constant factors do actually matter. 
that in, say, your data structures course, uh, you may have uh, analyzed various algorithms and data structures uh, using big O, uh, uh, kind of worst case asymptotic analysis. And in that case, if something was uh, uh, took two times more work than something else, is that does that is that different in, in big O terms? No, we say you know it's when n is really big, you know constant factors they don't really matter. Um, but I want to demonstrate that there are cases where this this has a, a really clear effect, and you know perhaps in in surprising places. So here I have two Java functions, both to compute a factorial. Factorial being uh, two times three times four times five, kind of up to whatever kind of factorial we are computing. So you can see one of these functions takes in an n and just multiplies together all the numbers from kind of two up to n, uh, and then returns the result. So it uses an, an iterative or, or a loop uh, to compute this factorial. And our second function here computes exactly the same thing, just recursively. And of each recursive call, we ask for uh, the factorial up to n minus 1, and then we kind of multiply by n after. And so if we were to analyze these two sort of algorithms for computing a factorial in asymptotic terms, uh, would they be the same or, or would they be different? Yeah, it seems like they ought to be the same. They're kind of doing the same amount of kind of general work, the same amount of multiplications either way. And it's just one of them involves a function call, one of them involves a loop iteration. And so I'm going to ask, well, is there a difference between doing it with a function call and doing it with a loop iteration? You can run this program which computes the factorials uh, 0 up through uh, uh, 19,999 for the iterative and then for the recursive times how long it takes. So in fact, you can see our recursive factorial time is about four times slower than the one that uses a loop. And in theory, these should have been you know, almost the same. But it turns out that making a function call, when we get down into the guts of what the computer is doing, is significantly different than doing another loop iteration. And different enough that it can make your program four times slower when you do the, when you do the extra work involved with a function call. And when we uh, look, at, look at assembly programming and how function calls uh, are, actually, uh, are actually implemented at this kind of low level, we're going to see exactly what work is happening that is making this, this slower than, than just using a loop. One thing that we might take away from this is that, at least in Java, if we can do something with a loop, instead of doing it recursively, that might be a more kind of in practice efficient approach. So it's not true of all programming languages. This is something that, you know, You'll find in Java and Python, uh, but not necessarily other languages. Questions on this one? All right, I have another uh, constant factors matter demonstration. So here I have a large two-dimensional array of uh, floating point numbers. So uh, 10,000 by 10,000, uh, so 100 million numbers in this two-dimensional array, uh, and I fill them all up with, with random, random values. And then I time how long does it take to add up all these uh, 100 million uh, uh, values, where I iterate kind of over the first index of the array, and then over the second index, kind of in that order. Then I kind of redo, kind of regenerate all the random numbers uh, to kind of make these more comparable, uh, and then 
time the same process of summing up all these numbers and just switch the order of two lines. So in this first one, I'm looping over the first index and then the second. And then in this one, I'm looping over the second index and then the first. So I'll then switch the order of these two loops. Uh, and this is changing kind of the order in which I go through this two-dimensional array. Kind of in one of them, kind of moving one element at a time, and in the second one, I'm sort of kind of jumping more elements at a time each, each time around the loop. So just switching two lines doesn't seem like uh, it should have have be that big a deal. We see that the first one took about a thousand milliseconds, the second one took five thousand milliseconds. I'm going to run this one more time. This is actually as similar as I've ever seen these two. So this makes it at least five times slower, just to switch the order of these two lines. And it's because the computer system is actually taking, when we access parts of the computer's memory, it's taking parts of it and making it faster if we're going to access that same memory again in the future. And it's doing this kind of totally invisibly to the program. But it means that the system is assuming certain ways of accessing memory on the part of the program. And in order to take advantage of this, in order to get the faster version instead of the slower version, we need to know about what the system is doing so that we can actually write code that is sort of matching what the system assumes uh, fast code will do. Alright, so that's um, some things that I hope kind of illustrate why we might need to care about uh, computer systems and what uh, goes on uh, underneath when we run a program. So uh, what I would like to, to do now is to kind of tell you about uh, uh, something that, uh, that you, you might find interesting, and that is uh, the Articles of Confederation. So uh, throughout this term, for a few minutes each class, I'm going to be talking about some first in U.S. history. Why? Because I like U.S. history and I get to decide what happens. <laughs> so uh, today it's the first government uh, of the United States, which was the Articles of, of Confederation. So after the Revolutionary War, a bunch of guys got together and decided what the government was going to be. Uh, the, uh, the first line of this Articles of Confederation is, is uh, uh, not, not the punchiest. To all to all to all to whom these presents shall come, we, the undersigned delegates of the states affixed to our names, uh, send greeting. So a little, little bit of a mouthful. Uh, here, here's a, a stamp commemorating the, uh, the Articles of Confederation in uh, 1777. Uh, and you may wonder, does the United States still use the Articles of Confederation? The answer is no. They totally sucked. They, uh, the, the people who came up with them uh, had just uh, fought, fought a war ostensibly to, to free the, the people from tyranny, and so they decided to make a government which uh, could do almost nothing, because then it couldn't be tyrannical, uh, it couldn't collect taxes, uh, it couldn't regulate trade, uh, it couldn't, uh, uh, and, and the taxes was the big one, because that means the government, when it needed money to do something, it had to just ask the states, please, could you give us some money? And as you might imagine, the answer was usually no. No, we're not going to give you money. No, thank you. 
Uh, and in particular, when there was a uh, uh, some farmers in, in Massachusetts, led by a man named Daniel Shays, uh, 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 tried to, to overthrow the government of, of Massachusetts, and uh, the federal government just couldn't really do anything about this. Uh, people decided maybe maybe we we need a different government. All right, so that's that's the U.S. history uh, for today. So one uh, one really important idea that uh, kind of runs through the entire course uh, is the idea of layers of abstraction. The idea that a computer system kind of consists of a bunch of these layers, kind of each of which is abstracting or, or kind of hiding the messy details of the layer underneath. And so kind of down, down at the very bottom of our kind of layers abstraction is sort of the laws of physics, kind of how do electrons move around, how, uh, 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 how, how do kind of fundamental particles behave, uh, we can get a little Uh, uh, our kind of next layer of abstraction on top of that would be uh, transistors and uh, kind of basically circuits and other kind of electronic devices kind of built out of uh, uh, these kind of uh, these transistors. And once we can build circuits, we can start to use those circuits to kind of construct logical behavior. Um, for example, you can uh, uh, create a circuit that computes an AND. Like if both inputs uh, have electricity, then the output has electricity. Or uh, an, uh, an OR, uh, uh, things like that. So we can kind of start constructing some, uh, some logic out of these circuits. On top of that, we have what's called microarchitecture, which is how does the actual central processing unit, how does the CPU inside your computer, actually assemble these logical operations that circuits can perform into something that can say add two numbers. Uh, uh, how does the CPU take the data that it gets and send it to where it needs to go? Uh, how is that? part of the system actually constructed. And once we have uh, the microarchitecture, we can build what's called the instruction set architecture, which now we're getting into the, the part that uh, we might see as a, a program that a human can read. And what are the fundamental instructions or operations that we can tell the computer to do? Uh, and what is, kind of what is the, the, the set of those instructions and how are they kind of expressed or encoded or, and, and sent to, to our CPU? On top of our instruction set architecture, Our next layer of abstraction is the operating system. And I would expect that when you have written code before, say to uh, open a file, read what's in the file, or write another file, print stuff to the screen, um, display graphics, play a sound, kind of all of these things, you do not have to think about the instruction set architecture. You do not have to think about what specific operations are being sent to the CPU, there was a layer of abstraction, the operating system, that was 
kind of hiding all of this messy details from you and just letting you tell it, open a file for me, and it takes care of the rest. Top of the operating system. We have the compiler or the interpreter. In the case of Python, it's an interpreter. In the case of Java, it's a compiler. Uh, but either way, it's a way of translating the programming language, whatever it is we're using, into something that our computer system can actually understand. So our programming language is often kind of what human programmers are going to read, how human programmers are going to think about how the system behaves, what software does. Uh, but there are these layers that abstract the sort of messy details of how we actually get the system to do those things. And then finally here at the tippy top, We have things like algorithms, data structures, uh, applications, and uh, this level of kind of uh, applications, data structures, etc. This is, for the most part, why we care about computers. Like, this is the stuff that we want computers to do. Like, we, we don't have a computer around just so it can execute instructions for fun. There's like some application that we want to make, some data structure that we need to make fast, something like that. So, in general, this is sort of our, our motivation, but in terms of, of this class, is really digging into these three layers here, our compiler, our operating system, our instruction set architecture. And one way we might think about these three layers is the hardware-software interface. As the, from the microarchitecture on down, these are things that are kind of part of the physical uh, uh, electronic design. And from the programming languages up, these are entirely the province of, of software. And kind of these three layers that we'll focus on in this course are kind of providing a way for the software to talk to the hardware and vice versa. They're kind of the interface between, uh, between these two. Does that make sense? Any questions on this? All right. So I said that we would talk about kind of a way we're going to think about numbers in this course, uh, and. Uh, the first is binary numbers. So uh, we're used to just thinking of numbers that we uh, uh, write down. Uh, if I say uh, 231, I might break that apart as uh, 200 plus 30 plus one. And like if I asked you like what kind of the two, what place is the two in, uh, what would you say? Yeah? Hundreds. Yeah, it's like the, the hundreds place, how about the three? Tens place, ones place. So we might write this as two times one hundred plus three times ten plus one times one. Uh, two hundreds, three tens, one one. And I might rewrite these factors here as 10 to some power. So I might say 2 times 10 squared plus 3 times 10 to the first 
plus 1 times 10 to the 0. And kind of from this idea, I get the name base 10. Like, this is a base 10 number because each place, each digit, is 2 times some exponent of 10. So 10 is kind of the base of all of these, all of these exponents. And so, when we're talking about binary numbers, we're really talking about base 2 numbers. So I'm going to have kind of a 2 to the 3 place, a 2 to the 2 place, a 2 to the 1 place, a 2 to the 0 place, and so that's really going to be an 8's place, a 4's place, a 2's place, and a 1's place. And so in our base 10 numbers, uh, how many different digits do we have? Like, how many, what are all the different possibilities for what I write down in the hundreds place? Yeah, I have 10 different possibilities, 0 through 9. Uh, and that follows from the fact that kind of each spot can have 10 uh, up to 9, and then once I get to above 9, I'm kind of moving on to the next place. So when we're talking about base 2, I have just two digits to work with, a 0 and a 1. And this is why base 2 is important when we're thinking about how computers function. Because whenever we're sending data uh, within a computer system or storing data in, in memory, it is, con it is either there is electricity or there isn't, where there's high voltage or low voltage. And this corresponds to there's a one or a zero. And so our, our, our base two numbers can kind of correspond to exactly how uh, information is stored on a computer system. And so if I have the binary number 1101, what would that be if I wrote it as a base 10 number? Yeah? Why do you say 13? There's one four. Exactly. We have an 8, a 4, we don't have a 2, and we have a 1. An 8 plus 4 plus 1 gives us 13. Does that make sense? Alright, so there's, so we have binary, we have base 10. Uh, we also are going to work with base 16 numbers, which are also called hexadecimal numbers or just hex. And so the exact same principle applies. We're going to have a 1's place, a 16's place, uh, 256 is place, that's 16 squared, and so on. So, anyone have a guess as to why we might care about base 16 uh, when, we're, when we're dealing with, with, uh, with binary numbers? Yes? It's a power of 2, so we can... Um, represented in binary pretty simply, I think. That's exactly right. But because base 16 is a power of 2, it's going to match up very nicely and predictably with binary in a way that base 10 would not. So, in particular, uh, 
every hexadecimal digit, if we have a hexadecimal number, every single digit in that number can be represented using four bits. And I should have said I have a single one or a zero is called a bit of information. And because we can just take a hexadecimal number and then every digit has exactly kind of four, four digits of binary, four bits that correspond to it, every binary number we can just take kind of four digits at a time, they correspond to exactly one hex digit, uh, it makes it very nice to work with in that by comparison a base 10 number we can't say exactly how many bits it would take to represent that number. Uh, if all we know is how many digits there are in the base 10 number. One, uh, uh, so kind of following the pattern here, how many different digits would our base 16 system need? Yeah. 16. Exactly. Our base 2 had 2 digits, base 10, 10 digits, base 16, we need 16 different digits. So we borrow the first 10 of them from base 10, 0 up to 9. But then we need some other digits to get us up to kind of 15, since uh, if we write 16 in hexadecimal, that's going to be 10. 1, 16, 0, 1s. It's also to say that when we write hexadecimal numbers, to make clear that they're hexadecimal and not base 10, they're usually prefixed with 0x. So 0x10, x10 would be our kind of 16 in base 10. So we need some more digits to get us up to kind of 15 before we carry over to the next place. Uh, and so we're just going to use letters instead of numbers. So A, B, C, D, E, F. So if I put this at base 10 versus X, that has 0 up to 9, which is uh, 0 up to 9 in hex, and we have 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, which correspond to A, B, C, D, E, and F. So if I say hex 2F, Take a moment and think about what would hex 2f be if I wrote it as a base 10 number. Go ahead and check in with the folks sitting next to you and of what you're thinking about converting this to a base 10 number. All right, what is, what is our, our 2f going to be? And why do you say 47? Uh, because it's 216 plus 15. Exactly. We have a 2 in the 16th place and an F in the 1th place. See that F is 15, so we have 2 times 16 plus 15. Does that make sense? Questions on this? Yeah. So could the same number be represented in multiple uh, can you say more what you mean? Like, oh, um, I feel like, could it, like, could you, like, when you get to, like, upper level numbers, could you be, like, um, it's, like, the same number can be represented by, like, different strings of, like, hexadecimal? Uh. Or does each base 10 number have a unique hexadecimal? Yeah, just like when we say, like, the number 123 
in base 10? Is there another way to, to write that in base 10? Uh, not really, because we need 1, 100, and 2 tens. Like, we could say, well, there's a 12 in the tens place, but like, that's the same as saying there's a 1 in the hundredth place. Uh, same idea with, with hex. That now every, uh, every number is going to have some unique hexadecimal representation. Other questions? So just to, to illustrate a bit what I mean by this kind of correspondence between um, uh, hex and base 2, We can look and say, kind of, what is the binary for each of these? Zero, of course, would be four zeros. Uh, nine, and eight, and a one out of our, our four binary digits. Uh, what would what would ten or or hex a be in binary? An 8 and a 2, and as we, we can kind of just keep adding, adding 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, we add 1 to this, carries over, carries over, and see that 12 is an 8 and a 4, uh, 13, an 8, a 4, and a 1, 14, an 8, a 4, and a 2, and 15, an 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. And so every single hex digit corresponds to a particular four-bit pattern. So for kind of any uh, uh, string of, of ones and zeros, it kind of matches up exactly to we just take every four and turn them into a hex digit or, or vice versa. Whereas we can see over here in base 10, like some, uh, uh, there's not this nice kind of every uh, uh, base 10 digit, and it doesn't have uh, its this nice predictable 4-bit pattern. One, uh, so there are some some practice problems uh, uh, in the in the textbook on on hexadecimal. Uh, there is also link from the course web page uh, flippy bit and the hex and the attack of the hexadecimals from base 16 which is uh, a good way to, to practice this, where uh, you need to kind of uh, put in uh, the eight bits corresponding to the numbers that are coming down at you. Uh, seven, one, there's seven, and then a one, and, and so on. Uh, survive, survive the attack of the, the hexadecimals. Uh, and I, I bring this up to uh, emphasize that we're going to be relying on binary and hexadecimal throughout the entire course. So the sooner that you feel comfortable with uh, the system of numbers, the easier things will be. So I strongly recommend kind of doing some practice now. There's also a review quiz on Moodle to help check how you're, how you're understanding it. Uh, will will definitely pay off. Uh, any other questions on uh, hex or binary, any of this stuff? All right, I want to make sure that I have time to talk about uh, the necessary administrivia. So I'm going to bring up the Moodle here. I'm going to switch this over to the screen. And turn down the lights. All right, so have the Moodle. Uh, the Moodle is uh, where you will uh, often submit uh, assignments. Uh, there is an introductory survey, help me get to know you a little bit, uh, that I'd like you to fill out by Friday. Uh, should, should be pretty quick. Uh, there is a link uh, if you want to send me feedback anonymously. Um, uh, 
If there are, are announcements that I need to send out, I'll send them out via this announcements form, which will also show up in your email. Uh, but kind of the most important uh, thing about this Moodle is that it links to the course webpage where all the actual information is. So the most important part of the course webpage is the calendar. Uh, this calendar shows uh, the topics for uh, every class meeting we have. Uh, it shows my, my office hours uh, here, in, here in green. So I will uh, be in my office 10.30 to noon on Mondays and uh, 3.30 to 4.30 uh, on Wednesdays. Uh, and then I will be in the computer lab uh, the big computer lab in Olin, Olin 310. I'll be in there 7.30 to 9.30 Tuesday evenings. Uh, particularly Tuesday evenings because that's when uh, the quizzes are due and all, most but not all uh, homework assignments will be due on Wednesdays. So what are the, the homework assignments in this course? There will be six uh, programming lab assignments that will form the majority of the work in the course. Uh, the first one, lab zero, uh, will go out on Friday. And uh, all the lab assignments will involve a post on a check-in form. Uh, these will be uh, on, these check-in forms will be on Moodle and the post will be due kind of about halfway between when the assignment goes out uh, and when it's due. And these posts should be uh, something that you're, you're stuck on, something that you realized that was helpful in the assignment, um, some kind of resource that was helpful in completing the assignment, uh, a question that you have, a response to someone else's post. They're a way to kind of have all of us work together um, at, at figuring out uh, the labs. Um, the uh, one other note about the labs, and this gets back to my uh, start early and ask lots of questions. These check-in posts are not going to be helpful to you if you haven't started the assignment when you make the post. You will not have anything useful to ask or to contribute uh, if you haven't started yet. Um, I've also heard from folks who have taken this class before that when an assignment uh, say has uh, a week and a half or two weeks that you're given to do it. It's like having a week off from homework and then you know having a lot of work after that week off. I cannot emphasize enough that that is not why I give you a week and a half to two weeks. I Many of these assignments will uh, have points where you might get stuck. And I am very happy to, to help the lab assistants uh, can help you, your, your classmates can help you, but if you're getting stuck the night before it's due, because you've been working on it for only 24 hours at that point, you're going to have very limited ability to get help. Uh, and so it is, it is really going to be to your benefit to try and work consistently uh, on the assignments in this course. Uh, rather than to, to leave them to, to the last minute. Uh, there are going to be weekly quizzes. Uh, these will, um, I think for the most part, be on Moodle. Uh, they will go out Mondays and be due Tuesday night at 9. Everything in this course will be due 9 p.m. Um, and uh, the quizzes will be untimed and they will give you immediate feedback on whether your answers were correct, and you can submit them any number of times. So the idea behind the quizzes is there a way for you to check your understanding and then to practice and work through it until uh, you, have, you have mastered those concepts. Yes? For the assigned readings, are those, uh, like for the one for Monday, is that assigned Monday or is it be read by Monday? So, uh, I honestly do not have a strong opinion on whether you do the readings before or after class. Uh, the readings are typically intended to emphasize a, kind of the key point from that day. They're not they're uh, they're deliberately kept short to make them easy to do and to focus on 
like one key idea from that day. Uh, and so I think it really varies from person to person whether it's more useful to do that as a review after you have seen the material in class or to do it before and kind of come to class to, to see that idea a second time. Uh, uh, I would say the one uh, 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 I would say perhaps the most important readings of the entire course are the ones for next class, for Wednesday. They're all about pointers in C, and uh, this is uh, the kind of thorniest idea about working in C. Uh, and in large part, the reason that we use C in this class is because they, uh, the C program image is very close to how things are represented in the computer's memory, and that's relate, and that relates to this idea of pointers. Uh, so, uh, I really recommend doing uh, doing uh, Wednesday's Wednesday's reading. Uh, the rest, most of the readings will be from the uh, uh, computer uh, systems uh, programmer's perspective uh, textbook. That's this CSPP. Um, I will be honest with you. Uh, opinions of this textbook uh, vary wide, widely. I think it's really great. Uh, I think it's a really excellent reference, particularly when we get to all the assembly programming stuff. Uh, but not everyone shares that view after uh, experiencing this textbook. Um, so uh, I uh, wanted to, to lay that out there. Um, I think the only other thing from the calendar at this point is that we will have a final exam um, uh, at 3.30, Monday, June 6th, uh, in this room. Yes? Um, if you go back to the top, like the page reference for the chapter we are reading is not really correct. Do we... Oh, this page reference? Yeah. Um, yes, so uh, that's probably my mistake. Um, uh, if there's something weird about the reading, like pages aren't right or, or whatever, just send me an email. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, I'm sorry if, if those pages aren't right. Uh, other questions? All right, a few things about course policy that I want to, to emphasize. Uh, there's uh, lots of kind of detail and, and resources linked from this, this web page. Um, the uh, late policy in this course is that you have four late days to use however you see fit uh, across the term, where a late day is a 24-hour extension. And so you can take any deadline, any quiz deadline, any homework deadline, and extend it by chunks of 24 hours up to four times across the, the, the length of the term. Uh, the only thing that you cannot use late days on other than the final exam, of course, is uh, the very last lab assignment. Due to the last day of class, I've been told that I cannot offer extensions past the last day of class, uh, and so you will not be able to use late days on that, on that final lab. Uh, there's a note on, on inclusivity that I think is the most important thing on this kind of syllabus uh, portion of the webpage, so I just want to, to read it uh, in its entirety. Uh, please treat your classmates with kindness and respect, both inside the classroom and out. Classrooms can be vulnerable environments. Uh, asking questions and expanding our understanding of new concepts requires us to reveal over and over again that we don't know uh, something fully. And it's okay to not know everything immediately. Uh, it's not okay to make people feel bad about what they don't know. And this can happen in, in, in subtle ways. Um, our individual, individual differences uh, enrich and enhance our understanding uh, of one another and the world around us. Uh, and this class welcomes the perspectives of all ethnicities, genders, religions, ages, sexual orientations, disabilities, socioeconomic backgrounds, regions, and nationalities. Last uh, bit of policy that I want to touch on is academic honesty and collaboration. Uh, so there's a lot of detail here. Uh, and various examples, uh, but to boil it down to a couple points. Uh, the first is I encourage you to 
collaborate with each other, help each other out. Uh, the first four lab assignments will be individual. The last two, you will have the option of working with partners, if you would like. Uh, but even for the individual assignments, collaboration is, is welcome. Uh, but I ask that when you collaborate, it be uh, in English and not in code. As in, the collaboration should not take the form of copy-paste, here's my solution, the end. Right? It should be, how did you approach the problem, having some discussion about uh, the actual ideas and not just uh, uh, sending code back and forth. Um, this extends not just to collaborating with your classmates, but with uh, uh, strangers on the internet. Uh, for example, uh, if you uh, search out on the internet a, say, complete implementation of a particular lab assignment, uh, that would constitute uh, uh, disallowed collaboration, because you are not in dialogue with the person whose GitHub you have stumbled across, uh, you are just looking at their solution uh, and taking directly from there. Uh, does that make sense? All right, so we have a few minutes left. So there's uh, another idea uh, that I want to touch on, um, which is here that when we're dealing with computer systems, particularly at a low level, everything is bits. Uh, and that, that means that when we're considering the computer's memory, it's just ones and zeros in there. Uh, uh, and what those ones and zeros mean is not part of what's in the computer's memory. It's part of how a given programmer operation interprets those bits. And a given sequence of bits can be interpreted in different ways. So for example, if we have the hexadecimal, uh, uh, if we have in memory hex 4E6F21, uh, by the way, how many bits is that number? Yes, why 24? Because each hex digit takes up how four bits. Exactly. Six hex digits, four bits per digit, four times six is 24. This is 24 bits of, of information. Um, and we can interpret that 24 bits as the base 10 integer, 5,140,257. Uh, we can interpret it as the characters n, capital N, lowercase o, exclamation point. So why could we do that? If in a terminal on Linux I run man, which is short for manual, uh, and then ASCII, which is a, a standard for how to represent characters in a computer system, it will show this chart and I can look in the hex column here for the first two hex ah, here we go hex 4e is capital N and I can find uh, hex 6f lowercase o hex 21 exclamation point. Uh, each pair of hex digits is, uh, could be interpreted as one of these ASCII characters. So these three hex digits could actually be, be a string instead of a number. Uh, these uh, six hex digits could be uh, interpreted as a nice green, uh, a nice olive green color. Uh, that when we're working with colors, particularly on the web, uh, Colors are, are often specified as uh, three pairs of hex digits, uh, namely a value for red, a value for green, and a value for blue. And so instead of writing 7811.33, we can write 4E6F21. Uh, anyone know or have a guess as to why hex 
gets used for these color values instead of the, the base 10 numbers? Yes? Is the max for each color 256? Exactly. That for each color we have 256 different possibilities. When we have two hex digits, that gives us 256 different numbers that we can represent from 0 up to 255. And so this is another situation when we're dealing with uh, powers of 2 that hex digits, I mean, we can represent any of those with just two hex digits versus for base 10, it's maybe 1, maybe 2, maybe 3 uh, uh, base 10 digits. Uh, and uh, finally, if we interpreted uh, these hex digits as a floating point number, uh, we'd get the real number 7.2 times 10 to, to the negative 39. And if we just saw these 24 bits in the computer's memory, there would be no way of knowing like which of these four or any other possible interpretation it would be. It would simply be a, uh, that would be a property of whatever program was using that memory and interpreting uh, those bits. All right. Any last questions about uh, anything we've talked about today? All right. That will do it. Uh, remember to fill out that introductory survey on Moodle, and I will see you Wednesday.